One thing that I've learned that I perhaps did not expect is how weird people are about the word vagina. Yeah, people are <laughs> super uncomfortable with the word. Yeah, when I did TED Med, we had to like reword everything. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, like, I didn't say vagina, and I didn't say, you know, heavy petting or oral sex or anything like that. <laughs> but heavy petting is a euphemism. <laughs> I, know. I know. So, why did they want you to change the words? Uh, I mean, well, nobody told me, but oh, okay. I assume that it's just because they thought everyone would get the vapors if they, <laughs> if they heard me say vagina, I guess. Hey there, and welcome to In Sickness and In Health, a podcast about chronic illness, disability, medical traumas, and everyday uncomfortable healthcare experiences. My name is Kara Gale. I'm not a doctor or a medical professional. I'm just a person and a patient who really wants to talk about this stuff more. Nothing said on this show should ever be considered medical advice. If you're experiencing a medical issue, please seek qualified medical help. I know the system sucks, but I do wish you a lot of luck. Every person is different, even within disease groups, so none of my guests should ever be regarded as official representatives or spokespersons for their conditions. Please respect their very personal choices, and unless they ask for it, please don't make suggestions about treatments or lifestyle changes. Unsolicited medical advice is never not annoying. I hope I didn't scare you off with the vagina talk already because it is kind of my favorite topic and this is a really fun episode. Well, as much fun as we can have with an episode about chronic pain in what is often indirectly referred to as the quote-unquote lady parts. Of course, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, owning a vagina and or any of its little pelvic organ friends is not necessarily limited to the ladies. So unless you're ready to start saying the word vagina loud and proud, we should probably come up with a more gender neutral euphemism. So if you are uncomfortable with some of what we're talking about, take a deep breath, relax, try not to get the vapors. I promise this one is at least very funny. The terms vagina and vulva are often used interchangeably when talking about said parts, but they are actually two separate things. Well, they're not totally separate, they're actually connected to each other and part of a larger, more complicated constellation of pelvic organs. The difference is important anatomically speaking, but colloquially and for the purposes of this episode, vagina is often used to refer to the general area, and that's okay. I just wanted to make sure you knew the difference. A good example of how the terms are used interchangeably is when people suggest that Georgia O'Keeffe's abstracted floral paintings are actually paintings of vaginas, but it would be more accurate to say that they are paintings of vulvas. It turns out they're paintings of neither and actually really are just pictures of some plants. Georgia O'Keeffe was an American artist active from the 1910s through the 1980s and is best known for her paintings of enlarged flowers, New York City skyscrapers, and New Mexico landscapes. If you don't know who I'm talking about, you'd probably recognize some of her paintings if you saw them. O'Keeffe is considered by many to be the mother of American modernism. In the show notes, I'll have a link to learn more about her and see some of her work. Even though she rejected the sexualized interpretations of her own paintings, O'Keeffe's work served to inspire generations of feminist art involving the vulva, all of which she shunned, which, side note, I think is a total bummer. But at the same time, I can imagine how distressing it must be to have your work held up to represent something that you did not mean it to. Georgia O'Keeffe struggled with mental health issues, which included what was referred to as a nervous breakdown in her mid-40s. Those colorful floral paintings she's best known for was work that she produced in her younger years. In her later years, she did more work in pencil, charcoal, and clay as her sight became compromised by macular degeneration, leaving her with only peripheral vision. She continued with this work into her 90s. 
She's always been one of my favorite artists, and as somebody who identified first as an artist and later as a disabled person, it's been really cool to revisit many of my favorite artists to find that they too lived with disabilities. So look forward to me finding excuses to talk more about them on future episodes. If you have any recommendations of disabled artists or books or other media about them, send them my way. I would love to hear about them. In the show notes, I'll also include links to learn more about the other stuff that we talk about in today's episode, which will include some diagrams and discourse to better understand the whole vagina versus vulva situation. Even without a diagram, a good shortcut is to think of the vulva as the outside part and the vagina as the part inside the hole. Like I said, they're part of a larger system, so the thing about having a vagina and a vulva is that there's a lot going on down there. There's also the uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, bladder, add to it all the digestive plumbing that we have hanging out in our pelvises, and there's an awful lot of things that can go wrong there. It's not uncommon for one problem to trigger another, or several, and that's exactly what we talk about in today's episode. I talked to Erin Barker, a New York-based storyteller and senior producer of The Story Collider, a podcast that records people's personal stories about science told live on stage. In the show notes, I've also linked to some of Erin's storytelling, including the story about her experience with interstitial cystitis and vulvodynia she told at The Moth. We talk about her diagnosis, some of the uncomfortable social situations her condition has put her in, being the weird girl at work, and getting Botox in my head and her vagina. Interstitial cystitis, or IC, also called painful bladder syndrome, is a little heard of, poorly understood condition that affects the lining of the bladder. Vulvodynia, which of course also remains little heard of and poorly understood, literally translates to unexplained vulvar pain and can be localized to one or more specific areas of the vulva or more generalized pain in the area. We don't know the true prevalence of either condition, but it seems that they are relatively common and present on their own, together, or secondary to other medical conditions. As you can imagine, these are conditions that people don't talk about much, even though they are relatively common. In episode 5 of the podcast, Kathy mentioned that she has IC, secondary to rheumatoid arthritis, but didn't get to talk much about the bladder problem. I've actually gotten several requests from listeners to have people on the show to talk more about IC, as well as requests to cover vulvodynia. I'll use any excuse to talk to people about their pelvic pain, but not everyone is super psyched to talk about it themselves. I am really excited to bring you this episode. I was looking for someone to cover these topics for a while, so I'm very grateful to Erin for sharing her story and doing it in a way that has made me laugh so much while I was editing. In today's bonus episode, we talk about podcasting and the power of telling our stories, her work with the Story Collider and the Moth, and the somewhat unorthodox relationship with her faith she developed during some of the darker times in her experience with IC and vulvodynia. You can find resources and more from us at insicknesspod.com and on social media at insicknesspod. You can shoot me an email at insicknesspod at gmail.com. I might not get back to you right away, but they mean a lot to me and I'll reply eventually. Check out the podcast Erin produces at storycollider.org. And like I said, find links in today's show notes to hear her stories told live on stage. If you can, please rate and review both of our shows on iTunes, which helps other people find us. And I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. I got sick when I was 23, and um, when you have interstitial cystitis, it basically manifests at first. It feels like a bladder infection. Mm-hmm. Um, and so first I thought I just had a bladder infection, but then it didn't go away. And then I kind of knew what I had. I was in kind of an unusual position as a chronic illness sufferer, and that um, I already knew what I had because my mom has it and my mm-hmm. grandmother has it. And when that infection didn't go away, I figured I'm next. Because my mom has been telling me, you're going to get this since (laughs) I was like a teenager. So 
Um, but it was funny because I still had a hard time finding a doctor who would mm -hmm. diagnose me even though I would go in and I would say, my mother has this, my grandmother has this, I think this is what I have. They would still say, uh, I think you have a chronic bladder infection. They just keep giving me antibiotics for like six months. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was really starting to break down because, um, you know, I felt like I had to pee for six months. That's terrible. <laughs> and uh, my mother did some research and found a doctor in New York who kind of specialized in IC and pelvic pain and that kind of thing. And I went to him and he was just like, yeah, you have it. <laughs> What kind of, like, testing did he have? Did he do any testing? Yeah, he yeah. did do a test. And the test, well, I don't know if this is how they always diagnose mm -hmm. IC, especially now. This was a few years ago. But when he diagnosed me, the procedure was to inject potassium into my bladder and see if it hurts. Oh, no. <laughs> Super sophisticated. Yeah, I've had a few <laughs> of uh, similar things. Like, my physiatrist is like, well, we'll just do a nerve block and see if the pain goes away, then I guess it's that. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. That seems pretty imprecise. Yeah. Because I've definitely heard of people having uh, cystoscopy. I think that's... Oh, something. yeah, Where that's they, like, uh, put the camera up your... Yeah, I had that done as well. Uh -huh. It was very unpleasant, especially after the potassium. Because <laughs> he was all, I was in a lot of pain. Already it was very inflamed, and my doctor was just like, you have a very small urethra. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm glad this is funny for you. <laughs> Dainty urethra. Yeah. yeah. I guess I'll brag about it. Mm. But I remember, even though I knew that I had it, you know, there's still that part of your brain that thinks, but maybe I don't. Mm. <laughs> Um, and so to actually hear the diagnosis was kind of shocking to me in a weird way, even though I knew it was coming. And uh, I had invited my husband with my boyfriend at the time, and we lived here already. And uh, I hadn't invited him to come with me or anything. Um, but after the appointment, I was suddenly really angry that he hadn't come with me, you know. <laughs> I was like, how could he not be here for me? And he works nights, so I got home and he was asleep. Mm -hmm. And I just went in there and jumped on him. And I was like, why didn't you come with me? And he was like, what happened? I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> and so it was really, it was kind of hard to come to terms with it for a while. Um, and I think my immediate reaction was a little bit of denial. Mm -hmm. And I thought, all right, I have this. And my doctor told me, that it'll probably be two years before I respond to the medicine. And in the meantime, I'm not going to be able to have things like alcohol or caffeine or chocolate or sex or wear pants comfortably. And so I thought, I'm going to be an exceptional patient. And I'm going to get, I'm going to be like that patient who gets better in like two months, you know? <laughs> I was like, I'm young. I'm in great shape. I'm going to do it. Um, and then two months later, you know, I had a sip of a margarita at my husband's birthday party and, like, collapsed in staggering pain mm. in front of all of our friends. And that was kind of a wake-up call that I was in yeah. it for the long haul. Did your friend, like, were your friends aware that you were having health issues prior to that? or No, I got very isolated during this time, um, which I think is pretty common for mm -hmm. people with chronic illness, especially with a chronic illness that's embarrassing to talk about or unladylike yeah. to talk about. Um, it's this weird conflict between femininity and not femininity with this illness because mm -hmm. it's like, on one hand, I had to wear dresses and skirts every day for two years, which I'd never dress. done yeah. before. Never. I probably own like two at the time of diagnosis. Uh, but at the same time, I can't have sex. <laughs> so it's like all this forced femininity, mm -hmm. but then just like robbing me of my sexuality. And it's like a very strange position to be in. It's the way the whole thing is. And I think it, it was especially difficult because of the culture. Because mm -hmm. um, I would, you know, I remember I would turn on the TV and I would see like a sitcom and they'd be like, Oh, so you take her out to dinner, but you guys don't have sex? She's probably, she's not really your girlfriend. She's just your friend, you know, like jokes like that. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, what if that's what Justin and I are going to become? You know, I would think, am I, I don't know, ripping him off of some kind of experience 
Um, and then you'd have shows like Sex and the City where a character had the same thing that I have and got over it in one episode. Oh, really? Which character was it? Charlotte. Okay. She had, she had not IC, but she had vulvodynia, which mm-hmm. is my companion illness, which is a really cute name yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah, little buddies. <laughs> and uh, one of the things they prescribe for vulvodynia is an antidepressant. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there were all these jokes about Charlotte's vagina is depressed, you know. And I threw things at my TV. Yeah, you should. <laughs> you should. Oh, television. Mm. Um, but I got really isolated because mm. I didn't want to talk to any of my friends about it because I was afraid of grossing them out. Mm-hmm. I was like, no one wants to hear about my sexual issues, you know. <laughs> no one wants to think about me and Justin having sexual issues. just felt really... Weird, and even though, you know, my mom and my grandmother both had it, I didn't want to talk to my mom about, like, whether or not she was able to have sex with my stepdad or yeah, anything like not, that, you not know? Not at the top of the list of the priorities. Yeah, yeah, so I was really not talking to anybody in my life about it, except occasionally Justin, but even him, I held a lot of things back because I didn't want to gross him out. I still wanted to feel attractive to Be him. an air of mystery. Yeah, I didn't want to <laughs> feel like this girl with the science project vagina. <laughs> And so I got into this really weird place where I was doing all of these out of character things, you know, like not drinking and wearing dresses. But my friends didn't really understand why. They didn't understand why I was so stressed out, why I was being weird. The first time I wore a dress to work, I think everyone was sort of like, Are you going to a job interview somewhere else <laughs> later today? And I was just like, Oh, I just felt like dressing up. <laughs> and they were like, Okay, nobody dressed up in my office because it was, you know, publishing yeah. office. So, And then I would, um, I don't think you realize until you can't drink Coke for a long time how magical mm-hmm. it feels on your tongue mm-hmm. when it enters your mouth. It's true of coffee, <laughs> it's true of alcohol, like all of those things. You really don't appreciate it until you miss it. And then, like, also, you don't notice how big of a part of the culture it is. Like, mm. I don't drink for medical reasons, and it confuses the hell out of everyone that I'm neither pregnant nor in AA. They're like, yes. what do you mean you're not an alcoholic and you don't drink? I don't understand. Just have one drink. I'm like, it doesn't <laughs> yeah. work like that. Uh, yeah, I run into that a lot, and I'm like, well, I could pee blood everywhere tonight Mm -hmm. that could be fun or I could just not have a drink (laughs) uh yeah I definitely I think it's especially awkward when you're out with your co-workers Mm -hmm. you know because that's especially a topic you don't really want to touch and in a a place where you want to come off as professional Mm -hmm. so yeah I, I had a really I had a really hard time kind of deciding how to explain myself or whether or not to explain myself mm -hmm. And I eventually reached sort of a breaking point where I was just holding it all in so much. I would do this thing where I was so self-conscious wearing dresses because it's so not my personality. And I would just feel really uncomfortable like I was being, like I was trying to be someone I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time while I was in denial, I would still wear jeans to work but I would like under my desk I would undo the fly and loosen it up a little down there so I wouldn't be in too much pain and that worked great until you know me being me I forgot about it one day and ended up face to face with my boss's boss on my way to the kitchen (laughs) with my pants hanging wide open and uh, I think my favorite thing about that whole experience is I'd never explain myself I never made any effort to smooth that over I was just like well my pants were open in the hallway I'm just gonna move on (laughs) let that one lie Mm -hmm. and uh luckily that guy I think was laid off shortly afterwards so thank goodness for a terrible economy of Mm -hmm. 2010 (laughs) yeah dark times dark times for both the economy and your vagina (laughs) Uh, very much so. Um, so after that, I decided it was time to start wearing dresses into work. And my mother was very excited about this because my mother has been wanting me to wear dresses since I was a little girl. It's been kind of an ongoing battle for us our entire lives. Mm. I would uh, purposefully like 
get them torn up at recess or like hide them in places in the house so she couldn't find them, make me wear them growing up. Um, so my mom bought me a bunch of dresses because I'm really not good at coming up with outfits for myself. Mm. I, for a long time I would like go into Banana Republic and I would buy the exact outfit on the mannequin <laughs> <laughs> because I knew that those things matched and went together. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not good at that kind of thing. So my mom bought me a bunch of outfits and my mom, my mom loves sex in the city. <laughs> and she has this image of my life in New York is like Carrie Bradshaw. Yeah. Like, Where are you originally from? Uh, I grew up in Ohio. Oh, okay. And my family's from West Virginia. Okay. So it's easy to idealize the New York yes. lifestyle. Yes. Um, it's so my mom, my mom, I think thinks my life is very glamorous. <laughs> and not, you know... New York City just trying to kill you at all times. Yeah, yeah. not like stepping over rats that have been run over by cars in the streets. <laughs> I thought that Pizza Rat was like the most New York City thing I'd ever seen. Oh, and yeah. then I saw a video of a rat dragging another rat carcass down a flight oh, of subway God. stairs. And I was like, no, that's the most New York thing I've ever seen. That's too much. That's too much New York. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had this like slinky black dress that I was like wearing into work and just was totally not me in any shape or form and I just felt like people were treating me different like I was sticking out in the office and I was so uncomfortable the whole day and and I was getting so depressed because I was it was starting to dawn on me that like this is my life now for Mm -hmm. at least the next couple of years if not longer because the medicine Elmeron does not work for everyone. It doesn't work in two years for everyone. It doesn't work at all for everyone. And so I walked down on the street at the end of the day just feeling so defeated and just like awful about this way that I have to show myself to the world now. And this guy walks by me down the street and he goes, hey, where are you going? And I was just so like, don't treat me like a girl in a dress or, you know, <laughs> I just turned and I was like, fuck you. And I just like marched away. And uh, to my surprise, the guy chased after me. And I was like, oh no, what is this? I thought I had brought closure to this exchange, mm-hmm. you know, and he catches up to me and he goes, Aaron, it's Dan from class. I'm really sorry if I like, upset you. And it was this guy I'd taken a storytelling class with, and I hadn't recognized him because he cut his hair. Mm. (laughs) And so it started dawning on me at that point that I was reaching kind of an unstable Mm -hmm. place because I was holding all of this in too much. And you think that you can like keep it on the inside and then it starts leaking out where you're just yelling at people to like fuck you on the street. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. There was no way I could continue just dealing with it Mm -hmm. on my own. And it was not just that. It was that I was having to leave work some days because I couldn't stand to sit in my chair Mm -hmm. for, you know, eight hours straight. It was so painful. I would stand up at my desk. I was just having all kinds of problems. So after that, I started talking to people. I started I kind of went on this tour of telling all of my friends uh, what was going on with me. And I told my boss, which was maybe one of the hardest things, because he's like, he's like a man in his 50s and <laughs> he's a very intimidating yeah. guy. Um, and, you know, there's no, like, section of the employee handbook that's like, this is how you talk to your boss about your vagina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, there's no section for it. <laughs> Like, talking about health issues at all, regardless of yeah. whether they involve your vagina or not. Yeah. Yeah. And just, it felt like such an unprofessional conversation to me, but he was so nice about it. I was totally surprised by how really kind everybody was. And he set it up so I could start working from home um, at least half the week so I could sit on my comfy couch instead of my hard office chair Mm -hmm. and I could you know when I had side effects from my medicine go throw up in the privacy of my own bathroom (laughs) what a luxury (laughs) I know it's extremely luxurious 
Um, but it really, like, it really changed my life when I was able to do that. I mean, I still, it wasn't all the way better. There were days when I was in so much pain that I had to be doped up on painkillers the whole day. Justin came home one day and I was at my laptop, just like slumped over <laughs> and passed out because I'd uh, passed out from the painkillers. And he was like, better check your email. <laughs> but it really helped a lot to be able to be home and to have the support of my boss mm -hmm. to know that he wasn't thinking you know that I was some kind of lazy employee when I was taking off time to go to doctor's appointments and having to rest because I was sick and oh I started telling my story on stage that must have been interesting yeah that was a big deal um what I mean the first time that you did that what was that the day leading up to it like were you like a basket case I am always kind of a basket case <laughs> before I do a show, but I think this one especially because I just, first of all, because I hadn't really told that many people, really only my immediate circle, mm -hmm. and also because there is still that fear that I was going to gross people out, mm -hmm. that people, were, I don't know what, if I expected people would just like throw vegetables at me <laughs> and be like, gross. <laughs> We don't want to hear about your nasty vagina. And uh, you had, you'd already been doing storytelling on stage. Yeah. yeah. I had told stories unrelated about my family and mm -hmm. things before. And so that was how I knew Ben, who ran the Story Collider, who invited me to do his show and tell the story. But you know what was what really shocked me when I told my story? Three people. This was probably a room of like maybe 40 people, three people came up to me after the show and told me they had the same or a similar condition. Yeah, that's not surprising to me. And they also told me they'd never heard anybody talk about it before and they also had never met surprising. someone else who had it. <laughs> yeah. And that was huge for mm -hmm. me because I'd never met anyone either. I had... Well, you probably have and you just didn't know because yeah. no one talks about <laughs> exactly. it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and I think that was when it really dawned on me how important it was to talk about it mm -hmm. and to know that you aren't alone mm -hmm. when you're dealing with these things because I really had some moments where I felt like I'm the only person in the world who's dealing with this. Is it, you know, especially when a doctor can't solve a problem for you, they have a tendency sometimes to make you feel like it's all in your head. Hmm, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> So I had that, and then I also had the isolation, so I just was like, am I crazy yeah. every day? I'm a crazy person. Yeah, I and definitely was starting to suspect that I was by, yeah. by the time I got diagnosed. And like even after I got diagnosed, like you said, you're like still not sure it's true or real or like especially when it's not a visible condition yeah, yeah especially that makes it a lot harder yeah and so that was huge and to hear that they'd all have the same like diagnosis experiences and things like that mm -hmm. it just made me want to keep telling it and keep telling it and every time I do tell it there's at least one or two people who come up to me afterwards yeah. and say they've been dealing with it too and so once I was out in the open about it I think that made it less scary to think about. Mm -hmm. I had kind of been, when I was diagnosed, my doctor, my urologist, gave me a business card for a vaginal surgeon and for a physical therapy. And both of those two options just seem so... <laughs> well, the, the person that I interviewed about endometriosis also got a referral for vaginal physical therapy and she was like, uh, that sounds fake, but okay. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, the idea of having someone rub your vagina, I was just like, nope. And the vaginal surgeon was like a double nope, yeah. like a scalpel to your vagina. That's, I couldn't, I couldn't even think about that. Yeah. And Justin, too, was like, I don't want you to do anything that's going to possibly make things worse or <laughs> yeah. put you through or anything like that. Yeah. Um. I didn't even realize that like surgery would be a possible course of treatment for this sort of thing. Yeah, well, it's it's not for IC, but for vulvodynia, mm -hmm. I think sometimes people have sections of their vagina removed, the parts that have the damage or that are causing them pain. Interesting. And my understanding is that sometimes that works out great and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I have not had any surgery at this yeah. point but I have had other things which I'll tell you about <laughs> looking forward to it um 
And the first thing I did was I went to what was called a biofeedback specialist. Mm -hmm. and, and for people who don't know, can you just explain a little bit about what that is? Sure. Um, I think it's, well, they, a biofeedback specialist in general, I think will put sensors on you and gauge how your body responds to mm -hmm. certain things. In this instance, it was very weird. It was like in an apartment. <laughs> and so I was like, I am going to get abducted. <laughs> and I got there and this man was like, go put this thing in your vagina under your skirt and come back. Okay. And it was, and then he just had all kinds of like really sketchy advice for me, yeah. you know, like. Well, I think also, I mean, there's the, the weird apartment thing, which is its own mm -hmm. thing that I think is pretty unique to New York, where you'll go to someplace and thinking it's like a real thing and it's just somebody's apartment. Yeah. Um, but when it's a dude counseling you on your vagina, yeah. a little hard to take that in, I imagine. Yeah, it would have been one thing if I was like going to a therapist or mm -hmm. something like that, but this was... It was too weird, and then he was, like, handing me catalogs with dildos in them, and, like, <laughs> he recommended me this book that he said had lots of advice on how to have sex without vaginal penetration. Mm -hmm. So at first I was pretty excited about that. I was like, oh, I'm going to uncover these secrets, you know? Because <laughs> like, this whole time I was sick, I was like, there's got to be some secret to how you can have sex without right. vaginal penetration. <laughs> Well, there are ways. Yeah, right? I mean, I there are, but... You exhaust those pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that was, like, my gynecologist. I also saw a gynecologist in addition to the urologist, and every time I left his office, he would be like, there's plenty of ways to enjoy yourself besides vaginal penetration. And I'd just be like, thanks, doc. <laughs> um, but, yeah, this book, I ordered it from Amazon. It was, like, out of print, which sort of been, like, a red flag. And then I started reading it, and it was, like, just this totally weird shit. It was, like, it's okay to have sexual feelings between siblings and stuff like that. And I was just, like, yeah, I was, like, I don't think this book is going to be the answer to my problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I got rid of that. <laughs> And that kind of scared me off for a while, but I was thinking, I looked into the uh, vaginal physical therapy, mm -hmm. and this was actually in a real office. Oh, good. good. <laughs> the experienced physical therapists who were women. Good. And I was like, maybe I can try this, and it'll be less creepy. Because the exercises the biofeedback guy gave me to do actually did help somewhat. So mm -hmm. I was like, something along these lines could be helpful, just not that. <laughs> not that guy. <laughs> no, not in that apartment. <laughs> Definitely no. I remember I went back to my doctor later, and he asked me how it went with that guy. And he was like, because some people find him a little bit creepy. And I was like, oh, thanks for the really? heads up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I went to vaginal physical therapy, and it was actually really great because I had never talked to, like, I never had a female. Mm-hmm. A medical provider before oh, dealing really? with this. Never. Oh. Um, my gynecologist, my urologist were both men, as had been all the other ones that I'd seen. And I just felt like they could understand in a way that nobody else I had seen could understand yeah. for obvious reasons. Uh, and I mean, it was definitely awkward mm -hmm. because it was, you know, somebody with their hand up your vagina for like a good half hour <laughs> feeling things out. Um, she just would, like, chat to me, like, have you seen, you know, the new movie <laughs> with Matt Damon? <laughs> and it was totally strange, but it was also really helpful. And I made progress, but at a certain point, I hit a plateau where I wasn't getting any better. It was like, I reached a point where I could wear jeans again, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. And I could sit in a chair and things like that for extended periods of time. Progress. Uh, yeah, it was, it was very fancy. Um, but I wasn't, I still wasn't able to have sex, really, at all. And so I started to wonder, like, is this as good as it gets for me? Am I never going to get any better than this? Because I feel like I've done all the things that I can do, and this is where I'm, I'm hitting this dead end. Um, and that was kind of like my second phase of depression. <laughs> I had the first phase, and then I snapped out of it, and this was my second phase. 
And、uh, now, would you say you snapped out of it, or would you say that like you'd been doing all of this work and kind of seeing some results, and that helped? And well, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm. It's, it's, it's never quite as simple as simply、yeah. snapping out of a depression. <laughs> exactly, exactly.、Um, so I was kind of finding myself in that same spot that、mm-hmm. I'd been in before, and at this point, it's been years. You know, and years since we've been able to have sex in any kind of meaningful way, years since I've you know had a drink, <laughs> and it was really hard. And then something changed, which is that Justin proposed to me, and it kind of it kind of kicked my ass in a way because I was like, he's really in this. He's committed to me for the long haul, even though we haven't had sex in years. You know, that's that was hugely inspirational to me, especially after all the horror stories that you hear about things that happen to people's relationships when、mm-hmm. they have to deal with this kind of thing. So, I sucked it up and I went to see the vaginal surgeon. <laughs> I dug up my like years old business card that I've been keeping in my wallet ever since, and I finally called him and I. I went, and he was, you know, he was a huge asshole. Of course. <laughs> I mean, he was like a huge prick. He would do like these tests on me, where basically he would just like poke me in the vagina and ask、mm-hmm. me if it hurt, you、mm-hmm. know, and like that typical like on a scale from one through five. Which every time anybody asks for my pain on a scale, like a numbered scale, I'm just like, fuck you. Yeah, no, the, <laughs> the pain scale is not a very、uh, helpful. <laughs> Gauge of how one is actually feeling. Yeah, and by the end there, I mean, I think at this point I have been suffering for almost five years,、mm. and so at this point, whenever I was filling out these doctor surveys, I just circle the tens, circle the tens. <laughs> I was like, I'm sending them the signal that I'm not fucking around. Right. This is serious. <laughs> yeah. It needs to be taken seriously. <laughs> yeah. And it was kind of funny because when I was first diagnosed, I had probably had maybe like two gynecological exams in my life before then.、And、I was really awkward about the stirrups and everything, but at this point, I'm like hopping on the table. I'm like, "That's ready to go." Who wants to see my vagina?、Yeah. I was like, "Here you go. <laughs> do what you gotta yeah. do." Yeah. I actually, yeah, when I was being examined, I would often just like cover my face with my hands and just like try, try to pretend it wasn't happening.、Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, he would he would do that thing where he would like poke me, and then I I would just be like, it hurts, yeah, and, <laughs> and then he'd be like, oh, but I didn't even poke you that time, and I'd be like, like he was trying to fuck with me. I felt、mm-hmm. like, and I was like, it hurts, okay, you know. <laughs> I, I've never been very good at like pinpointing where my pain is in that、mm-hmm. area. They're always like, you know, is it this part of your vagina or this part of your vagina?、Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I was never, especially with like IC and vulvodynia, they would be like, was、well, it your bladder or your vagina? And I was like, I don't know. It's all kind of in the same <laughs> yeah. place. <laughs> yeah. So when I had to do those kind of exams, they would be not only painful but just really stressful for me because、yeah. I felt like I was never giving the right answers.、Yeah. And it was just more of that feeling of coming off as like a phony or a fake、mm-hmm. or a crazy person that I hated. Yeah.、Um, so he's a total dick, but he was a very smart doctor. Which, unfortunately, those two things often go together. Unfortunately, it's true. <laughs> yeah. And、uh, he was really an expert in the field of vulvodynia, and he prescribed me this cream to apply every day, and then he also recommended Botox injections, which,、uh, while Disturbing to me to think <laughs> about was not as disturbing to me as surgery. Yeah, and he told me that he didn't think I would need surgery because of the progress that I'd already made,、uh, but that he wanted to inject some Botox into my vagina, and that insurance wouldn't cover it, and it、mm-hmm. was going to cost me about five grand. Wow. Yeah. He said probably in most cases、uh, I only have to be injected once, and I'm good to go. But sometimes people have to do it again. Yeah, I get them for headaches every three months. Oh, do you like、yeah. in the temple or? Well, it's actually they do your forehead and then like all over your scalp and then down the back of your neck and on your shoulders.、Mm. And、wow. that's been—I mean, I've had a headache since I was seven years old. Oh <laughs> and, my god!、Um, 
those have helped a lot. I mean, I still have a headache every day, but it makes a huge difference. And thankfully, insurance does cover it. So, But I did not realize that they Botox people's vaginas. Neither did I until I saw this particular doctor. And honestly, it, it sounded like one of those you know, phony things that is mm -hmm. never going to work. After a while, I feel like when you have a chronic condition, you start to feel like everything is a phony thing that's never going to work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Especially anything that's, like, not covered in by insurance mm -hmm. or is, like, experimental. You're just like, oh, geez, again. Um, but I had a good feeling about this doctor. I had a feeling like he knew what he was talking about. So I coughed up the money. I got my injections and... Wow. Yeah. Huge difference. That's awesome. Yeah. Isn't Botox magical? <laughs> <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, I have so many questions about that. Because, like, my forehead doesn't move the way that it used to. It is, oh, really? it is very wrinkle-free now that I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's one wrinkle, like, right in between my eyebrows where I, because I scowl a lot. <laughs> it's like my resting bitch face, but... Um, yeah, the rest of my forehead, like, doesn't really move, which is really bizarre. And it, the worst part about it is that, like, I'm a crier. I cry at least once a day, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, and so when I, tr like, when I'm crying, you know, you do the ugly cry face. But mm. because my face doesn't move the way that it's supposed to, I wind up getting really horrible face pain and, like, <laughs> oh, no. a wor like a way worse headache just from crying. I'm like, oh, why? <laughs> This is terrible. So I'm curious. I mean, not that our vaginas move a lot, you know, not quite as much as a forehead. But like, did you notice any like difference in how it? I don't. I don't even know what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> I know what you think. Yeah. Don't worry. Um, you know, it's weird because Botox. It's like you said. You think of it as being like a tighten tightener, mm -hmm. but. My doctor told me it's going to loosen things up. Well, yeah, it basically kind of like paralyzes the muscles a little bit, which <laughs> sounds like a really bad idea. Um, but for some reason, like works on the muscles and the nerves to make it kind of relax a bit. Yeah. yeah. So that was, I mean, I think I only had it done once. We compared to you having it done all the time. I'm sure it's a different long-term effect, but... Um, yeah, after I had it done, I just remember feeling very loose, <laughs> feeling like my vagina was basically going to, like, fall out oh, if I no. wasn't careful. <laughs> Did you know that that's possible? What? Yes. Oh, my God, I'm so glad I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, pelvic organ prolapse is actually a surprisingly common thing for, for older women. So the, I, I know about this because of the genetic condition that I have makes more susceptible to it. Oh, God. Hooray. Um, <laughs> But I was recently reading that, like, up to 50% of women by the age of, like, 60 will experience some form of pelvic organ prolapse. But no one talks about it because it's terrifying. Holy shit. Just a note, I misspoke here. It's actually up to 50% of women by age 80. I'll put a link to that article and more information about the condition in the show notes. But pelvic organ prolapse occurs when there is weakness or damage to the normal support of the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor holds up pelvic organs, so if the muscles and or layers of connective tissue become weakened, stretched, or torn, the pelvic organs may fall downward. The organs drop down from where they should be and can cause a whole mess of problems. In severe cases, women may feel or see tissue coming out of the opening of their vagina, so that's a fun thing that we can look forward to maybe dealing with in the future. So it could be anything from, like, your vagina just kind of hanging out a little bit to, like, full-on uterus falling out or, like... Oh, my God. Yeah. So, fun fact. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't know that was a thing that could actually happen. Yeah, it's really <laughs> horrifying to me, and every time I think about it, I'm just like, oh, no. I'm hoping that since I have no plans to have kids, like... At least I have that going for me. Yeah, My pelvic keep, floor keep it tight. Will, you know, keep it together. Yeah. <laughs> Horrifying. I don't know where to go from that. <laughs> Let me reference my notes. Um, so uh, something that you said in one of the stories that I watched, um, that your mother was kind of like overly concerned with health issues when you were growing up, like not necessarily a hypochondriac because it wasn't necessarily about her, but like 
she thought that when your brother had a stomach bug, he had Crohn's disease, or, like, your sister had an imaginary friend that she thought might be schizophrenia. And I'm always, like, so interested by how our family's attitudes about illness kind of shape our own approach to it. So I'm, I'm curious about how that kind of influenced this whole situation that you were in. Hmm, I think it contributed to some of my denial in the beginning. Because yeah. I was like, oh, well, mom's just a crazy person. <laughs> you know, and maybe mom imagined hers too, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I was probably more impacted by my family's attitude towards sexuality than I was by their attitude toward illness, I think. Um, I think my illness for me got wrapped up in a lot of the things that were going on with my family that made it harder to deal with. I mean, at the time, around the time when I was diagnosed in the the years, the subsequent years, my mom was getting divorced for the second time. Um, And my stepfather had had affairs and they weren't having sex anymore basically is what I feel like maybe I shouldn't say that on a podcast but there you go I can take it's it out, out if you want <laughs> and that just made me feel like you know society sends you so many messages you know when you're not having sex in your relationship your relationship is dead mm-hmm. you know that means it's over and so I was watching my mom's relationship kind of disintegrate and I thought, I just felt like this is what's going to happen to me, mm. you know? So I think it was probably more of that than anything else. Yeah, that's interesting. You spend a lot of time in the bathroom. Yeah, especially those first couple of years. Yeah, how many times a day did you, would you say that you had to go? Oh, God, I don't even know. I mean, after a while, I just sort of started ignoring it because really, I really felt like I had to pee for years. Mm -hmm. I would go to sleep feeling like I had to pee. I would eat all my meals feeling like I had to pee, you know. And After a while, you just start to block it out. And there were some times when I would go pee and I'd be like, huh, I actually did have to go (laughs) (laughs) because I just felt like that all the time, Yeah, you know. So that must get confusing, like not actually knowing when your bladder is actually full or not. Yeah. Yeah. So I just go all the time. And then I had a lot of, I had a lot of side effects with some of the medicines I was trying early on too. And I I was a big puker for a while, big Mm. time puker. (laughs) There was a crepe joint around the corner that I threw up in Mm. one day breakfast. It was pretty sweet. All these crepes are, I feel like crepes are a good food to throw up. Like they're, they're I actually didn't even get a chance to get my food. I threw up even before it came. Yeah. It's really unfortunate. (laughs) Did you rally and then like actually eat or? No, No, I went outside in the rain and continued puking on the sidewalk. It was the saddest thing ever. One of the employees brought me napkins. That was nice. (laughs) It was nice. They were really nice. (laughs) But I had a lot of I had a lot of incidents kind of like that. Lots of fun in airports, things oh, like that. Yeah. yeah, airports are a fun place for chronically ill people. <laughs> uh, I don't know, being the weird girl at work. Um I've been that girl. Yeah. It sucks. It's yeah. Not fun. And it's yeah, a lot of what you were saying about it's so hard to explain why you're not drinking and mm-hmm. I mean, especially, like, when you're in the diagnostic process and, like, you don't even know what's going on yet. And people are like, what's, what's wrong? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> Which makes it, all of this seem so much weirder. Yeah, I remember I had a doctor's appointment one day and I, one of my coworkers was just being friendly. And she was like, oh, no, are you sick? What do you have? You know, and <laughs> I was just like, I'd rather not say. Mm-hmm. And then it got really awkward. <laughs> Yeah. Well, because people feel so entitled to, like, extremely personal information that, you know, and also there's there's a lot of, like, complicated things around disclosure of illness at work because, like, yes, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, but that doesn't necessarily mean much. Um, Mm -hmm. I had a a situation where I, I wasn't really 
psyched on disclosing anything that was going on with me. First, because like I didn't really know what was happening. And then once I did, it was just kind of like really complicated and obscure. And like, how am I supposed to explain this to people? But like it got to a point where I did need to start working from home and stuff like that. So I had to also my boss was like working with a toddler and uh, we had our office door closed one day and he came by and like banged on the door really loudly, like as a joke. I I don't know. It's a place of business. I don't understand why anyone was acting like that, but I have a heart condition. Oh, no, (laughs) it scared the (laughs) shit out of me. And, And then he like barged into the room and I was on the verge of passing out. And like, it took me a while to like, calm my body back down like yeah my brain is fine but like I there's so much adrenaline coursing through my body right now and he was like god what's your problem and I had to be like I have a heart condition you asshole um so it was like little things here and there where I had to be like okay so I have this thing and blah 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 blah, blah and I would really appreciate it if you didn't scare the shit out of me <laughs> um or like I need to work from home and that sort of thing and so the more that I disclosed out of necessity, the less work I got. Oh. And so mm. I just wound up being kind of like phased out. Oh. In like a benevolent, ableist kind of way, which is really frustrating. Um, so. Yeah. You definitely, I feel like you hear about that kind of thing a lot. Or, or right. people who, because they can't see anything wrong with you. Mm-hmm. Why do you need to go to the doctor so much? You know? Right. I was really fortunate in that my boss uh, at the time, who's still a good friend of mine today, was really understanding. And, and his boss, um, I think, had a relative who had lupus. So he kind of understood yeah. what it's like to have a chronic condition. But I feel like when you have a condition like this, regulating your mood or your stress levels becomes very important, which is part of why you see this puzzle masterpiece. I do a lot of coloring books and puzzles to uh, chill myself out. Yeah. Yeah. Stress management is very important. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll lose your goddamn mind. Yeah. You you have to find your center sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, I didn't talk about this when I was first diagnosed and I I was really isolated. I was really desperate to talk to somebody about it. So I was going online, you know, and the the message boards and everything are terrifying. (laughs) They're they're terrifying. I mean, they're also, like, they're they're great for the reason that you were talking about before, of, like, hearing people say, me too. That's a really important dynamic. But on the other hand, you have a sample population that kind of self-selects and and therefore tend to be, like, the worst off Mm -hmm. people. So it's people with, like, the most nightmarish stories or, you know, people who really are um, interested in sharing their... uh, what's worked for them they think Mm -hmm. will work for everyone else which as we talked about before we started recording is not the case yeah you know people get like really aggressive and stuff like I because I was in a lot of like Facebook groups for my stuff and I had to like back up off of it because I was like this is getting a little out of hand yeah 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 it's just and I mean I understand I understand why it's cathartic for people who are mm-hmm. suffering to write about it. And I understand the impulse if you found something that works, if you want to help other people. Right. I mean, I, I get that, but I, it was very overwhelming mm-hmm. to see. And um, I just, I felt like I couldn't even get involved. In yeah. It. When, like, at what point in your 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 journey did you go online and, like, see that stuff? Because I feel like, what point you're at also has a big influence on how helpful online stuff is. That's a good point. I I think it was pretty early on when yeah. I was in that phase where I was like, I'm going to beat this in just a okay. few weeks, yeah. you know, and that was kind of like a cold bucket of water over yeah. my head. Too soon. Too yeah. soon. <laughs> Rude awakening. Yeah. Um, but through that, I, I met this woman who said she wanted to do like group therapy over the phone. 
And she was like a nurse practitioner who I think was kind of styling herself as like, you know, the expert Uh who's going to, you know, get everybody together. And and she said that uh, she wanted to do a phone call with me every week. And uh, this sounded like, I mean, I was so desperate. I was really desperate uh, to talk to somebody, anybody who could tell me like what to do, you know, because at this point, not only was I in pain, but I was really terrified of losing my relationship and you know everything that I had kind of worked for. And so I agreed to this, and um, it just, she would be like, I want you to switch to like an all raw diet and stuff like that. And I'd, some of the stuff I'd just kind of be like, okay. <laughs> But it felt, and she wanted me to keep a feelings journal and stuff like that. <laughs> and then finally... Which um, I'm sure can be helpful for I'm sure some can, people. I'm sure it can. I mean, and I, I did keep a feelings journal, and it was interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just... Do you still have it? Oh, God, no. I think it was oh. too it was too miserable to look at. <laughs> um, but at one point... My brother got arrested close to Christmas for, like, a drug-related thing, and he was in jail. And my dad called me, and he said, I have some news about your brother. And, you know, whenever you hear that, it's just like, it was almost like I could feel Mm -hmm. my bladder just, like, exploding in reaction. Uh, It was like there was a direct line from, you know, the stress part of my brain to the lady parts. And uh, so I talked to this woman about it, and she was like, well, you know, sometimes you just need to cut people out of your life for the sake of, you know, your own sanity because you have to prioritize, you know, your psychological health. Which is true, but... Like, yeah, don't but, tell strangers that you know nothing about their relationship with that person, yeah. that that's what they should be doing. Exactly, exactly, and... um Then she started telling me that, like, because my brother is gay, that, like, gay people are, you know, always getting addicted to drugs, and you know, and I was just like, all right, we're never talking again, (laughs) you know? Yeah. I just know this is never going to happen again now. Yeah. Um, So that was my my brief experience with trying to find a community before I told my story on stage. Yeah, interesting. The Internet is just full of just nightmare garbage information (laughs) oh yeah for sure that's really scary i mean especially for conditions like this that are poorly understood and there Mm -hmm. is such a dearth of of knowledge or doctors who know anything about it it's like the the stage is set for misinformation and pseudoscience to just flourish oh yeah yeah Yeah. People, people are trying to fill in the gaps on their own. Yeah, and they are desperate. Mm-hmm. Which is I so mean, sad. Yeah, literally, vulvodynia means unexplained vaginal pain. <laughs> it literally means... <laughs> we're just going to give it a name because we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't just call it unexplained yeah. <laughs> vaginal pain. we got to give it a fancy name. <laughs> vulvodynia. It's beautiful. It is. Name my first daughter that. <laughs> yeah. No, it does. It sounds like a lovely name. Um, <laughs> It's a nightmare. Yeah. I just want to scream. Because, like, I'm so used to, you know, being in the rare disease sphere where there is, you know, these conditions are poorly understood and there aren't a lot of specialists, if any at all. And, you know, like, all of these problems. And then, you know, I start looking into pelvic pain and women's health problems. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? All of the same problems. All of them. And, like, Mm. with, like, endometriosis, it's something that affects 1 in 10 of reproductive age. And I'm like, but it's, like, the furthest thing from a rare disease. It's so frustrating. I know. I know. I was definitely... I think that was also contributed to my denial at the beginning because I I was, like, how can this be real that there is this condition? Millions Mm -hmm. of people have it, and there's, like, no... Right. Nothing to do about it and no way to understand it. It was so mind-blowing to me because I had never encountered anything like that before. It's terrifying. I know. I mean, we can can keep Dick Cheney alive. (laughs) 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 
<laughs> Millions of vaginas Put a man all on over the, moon, the world. Yeah. Keep a Dick Cheney alive, <laughs> and we can't make people's vaginas feel okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is that about? Well, sexism. <laughs> I, guess, I guess that's the, the simple answer, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what it boils down to. <laughs> So I'm really uh, glad that you came to talk to me today. Appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you sharing <laughs> your time and experience with me. This was great. Awesome. Thank you for listening to In Sickness and In Health. Check out the links in the show notes to learn more about some of the things that we talked about in today's episode. And here are some of Erin's stories told live on stage. You can find more from us at InSicknessPod.com and on social media at InSicknessPod. If you can, take a few moments to rate and review us on iTunes. It will help other people find the show. And don't forget to be excellent to yourselves and each other.